Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Father. God, we're gathered together this morning, probably with all kinds of different motivations and reasons for being here. And we know that you see into our hearts and you know uh, just what we need. You know where we're at, what our struggles are. And wherever we are, Lord, on the spectrum of faith, what we desperately need is to be found in your presence. And God, just as we sang that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is made available to us, and we need that in our lives. And we know, Father, that it doesn't matter how hard we try or how smart we think we are. If your Holy Spirit does not show up in this moment, we, we won't really accomplish anything that matters. And so, Father, we beg you uh, that you'll fill this place with your Holy Spirit and be at work and accomplish the purpose of your word that you've given us. Pierce our hearts with it. Uh, transform us by the power of who you are that we might see the giants in our lives fall. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So we are in week two of a series called When Giants Fall. And the truth is, uh, for most of us, really maybe for all of us, we've got some kind of giant at work in our lives. Out of all the series uh, that we are going to do this year, this might be the one that touches the most of us. Uh, because of the giants at work in our lives. And for this series, we're going to be walking through the story of David and Goliath. Now, David and Goliath is one of those stories that even if you've never really opened up the Bible and read it, you're probably familiar with the story of David and Goliath. We've all heard about the young boy, David, who goes up against the great giant Goliath, and we see the massive giant who should have won. We see him fall. And I think one of the reasons this story is so popular, one of the reasons we're drawn into it is because that we have giants at work in our lives and we're all looking for hope that maybe somehow even the giant in my life can go down. Now last week, Nathan Russell did a great job launching this series and he talked about this one foundational truth that's going to go through this entire series that we need to hold on to. Because the temptation for most of us when we hear the story of David and Goliath Uh, What we think is, well, I need to be like David, and I need to go up, and I need to face the giants in my life, and I need to have courage, and I need to be strong, and and what I really need to think about is how to use the tools and the right weapons, and I've got to find the right stone to take down the giant in my life. Now, if you're anything like me, uh, you've tried that. And when you've tried to bring down the giants in your life on your own by what you can do and what you can think, you tend to fall flat on your face. And so Nathan reminded us last week that we're not to be David in the story, that there is uh, somebody who can be David in the story, but it's not us. It was the future king, not David or Solomon or anybody else uh, in his family, but one to come who was to be named Jesus. Born of, in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, who was going to be the, the one true king, the one true Lord, the one true giant slayer who would come into the world to take on the giant of sin and pain and brokenness. And he would once and for all defeat it, that when we receive him by faith, by trust, that even the giants in your life and in my life can come down. And we need to hold on to that truth Uh, as we walk through this series. But I want to add another key truth for us uh, as we build this together, uh, if you're okay with that. Uh, I think this is going to be something that we carry through the rest of this series, and here it is. In the story of David and Goliath, Goliath is not the only giant. As a matter of fact, Goliath is not really even the primary giant. Goliath is the face of all the giants that were at work in the life of Israel to keep them from stepping into the life that God had for them. That there were barriers at work in their life that kept the people of God from living out the purposes of God. That kept them from the future that God had for them. And Goliath came as a face of all of those barriers that were keeping the people of God from the purposes of God. 
And today we're going to focus in on one of those giants. We're going to go through some other giants as we go through this series. And I want to tell you uh, next week, you do not want to miss. You need to be here next week uh, as we talk about the giant of comfort. Uh, You're going to be blown away. It's not for me. Uh, It's going to be a message from Kim Ball, director of women's ministry. And we've been talking through that. And I'm uh, I, I sense that God's going to do a great work next week, so you need to be here. But today we're going to talk about the giant of fear. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to read verse 4 and then verses 8 through 11 and then verses 21 through 24. 1 Samuel 17. All right, verse 4. A champion named Goliath who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. So this is a big dude, right? And we jump ahead. Verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistines said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. And here it is. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were what? Dismayed and terrified. In verse 21. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. And David left the things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they are. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. And here it is again. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in what? Great Fear. See, this giant of fear was at work in the lives of the Israelites, telling them before the battle even began that there was no hope for victory. And that's what fear does in our lives. That what fear comes into our, our lives, into our thinking, into our feeling, and it tells us before we even get started that victory is not even a possibility. Here's what fear is for us. If if you're taking notes, uh, fear is believing in what may be over what already is. It, It sends me into the future thinking about the worst possible scenario as if it's already a guaranteed truth. Now, I don't know about you, But I struggle big time, way more than I would like to admit, with fear. I think a lot of us, maybe all of us at some point or another, we struggle with fear. We just don't always realize that we're struggling with with fear. We like to call it other things, right? Uh, I've got some stress. Uh, I've got some worry. I'm dealing with some anxiety. I would suggest to you that even things like sarcasm and negativity can be a sign of fear. That I don't really want to be known. I don't don't really want to be vulnerable and go there. So I'm going to be sarcastic or I'm going to be negative to hold things at bay because of the fear inside me. Many of us are struggling with fear. We look ahead. What's the worst possible thing? Well, that's probably what's going to be. You know, for me, it might look something like this. One of my kids uh, gets sick. Maybe they get the flu or they get a stomach bug. And all of a sudden, there's this battle going on between my heart and my head. In my head, I know, you know, it's just going to be a 24-hour bug. But in my heart, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, like the worst possible thing is going to be happening. And I'm on WebMD, and all of a sudden, I'm a doctor, and and I'm, like, diagnosing all of these symptoms. And I'm thinking they're going to be in the hospital, and and they're going to be hooked up to all these things. And I'm not going to be able to afford it. And so we're going to go bankrupt, and then there's going to be all this stress on my family. And I'm praying, playing out this worst possible thing as if it's already the guaranteed thing. 
Or it might be like my car breaks down or uh, something breaks in the house and, and all of a sudden there's a battle between my heart and my head. In my head I know it's just a little thing and I got it fixed. But, but in my heart I'm thinking, well, man, this, is, this whole thing is going to fall apart and then everything in my house is going to fall apart and then there's going to be all this stress in the house and everything's going to just be falling around and then I can't be uh, faithful to the relationships in my life because I'm so stressed out about all this stuff and I'm playing everything out. Thinking about the worst possible thing is the guaranteed thing. And that's what fear does. What may be overshadows what already is. And, and I can't see the relationships I have today. I can't see the resources I have today. I can't see the responsibilities I have today because I'm so focused on what might happen in the future. Now, I would tell you fear is not always a bad thing. It can be a good thing. You know, fear can protect us from some really big dangers and keep us from doing some really dumb things. But pro the problem with fear is when I leave it unchecked and it begins to take control over my life. And when I let fear take control of my life, two things are always going to happen. Number one, if I let fear take control of me, if you're taking notes, the battle is over before it begins. The battle is over before it begins. I mean, look at what happens with the Israelites. You know, I could understand it if Saul enters the battlefield, he gets into the valley, and the Israelites are fighting, and, and Saul, and he's, Goliath is just taking people out left and right, and he's, you know, just wrecking this, you know, savagery all over the battlefield, and people are running away. I could understand that. But that's not what happens in the story. What happens in the story? Look at verse 11. On just hearing... The Philistines' words, they weren't even engaged in battle yet, but just hearing his words, it says that they were dismayed and terrified. Or verse 24, whenever the Israelites saw the man, so he was still on the other side of the valley. The battle had not yet begun. He's on the other side, and they see him, and they flee from him in great fear. The battle was over before it even began for the Israelites. And that fear does that very same thing to us. Ends the battle before we even get started. For many of us, we will never take a risk because we're afraid we might fail. For many of us, uh, we will never really engage the problems in our lives because we're afraid of what might happen. For many of us, we will never step out in faith into the things that God is calling us to do because we're afraid we don't have what it takes. And before we even begin engagement in the life that God has for us, it's over. And we've got to really be able to look at our lives and say, God, what are the things, what is the fear in my life that keeps me from, from stepping out in faith into the life that you've called me to? What is it in my life? What fear is at work in me that is making it where the battle's over before I even get started? And there's a second thing that will happen when I let fear take over. When I let fear control me, it defines the rules of the battle. It defines the rules of the battle. And think about uh, with Goliath. Goliath, he's, he's camped out on the side of the mountain. So you've got the Israelites on one side on this hillside, and you've got the, the uh, Goliath and the Philistines on the other, and the battlefield is the valley in between. And they are just kind of got this standoff. And Goliath comes from his side, and he yells out to the Philistines. And he says, hey, listen, I've got a plan. I will go down to the valley just by myself, and you send your very best warrior. And I'll fight just that warrior. We don't have to worry about killing all these other people or having lots of bloodshed. It'll just be between the two of us. And whoever wins that battle between me and whoever your best warrior is, whoever wins, their people will be lord over the others. Whoever loses, your people will be servants to us. And the Israelites are just kind of like, okay, fine, we'll go with that. That'll be the rules of the battle. 
Now, in this day and time, that was not an uncommon practice. But here's the thing. God's people were not meant to be common people. Why in the world were they letting Goliath define the rules of battle? I mean, I read this story and I think to myself, wait a minute. Like, why didn't anybody stand up and look around and say, hey, we got a pretty good army here. And not only that, we've got a pretty amazing God who has shown up in some pretty miraculous and amazing ways. And we've seen that whenever we put our trust in him, he brings victory. So let's just all go down to the battlefield and let's all engage in the battle. And we'll fight Goliath and whatever other Philistine that wants to engage. Why didn't anybody do that? I think about why didn't anybody say, look around and say, hey, wait a minute. Uh, We've got some spears and we've got some javelins and and we've got some arrows here let's just take Goliath out from over here but nobody did that they just let Goliath define the rules of how they were going to engage and here's the thing is that fear does the very same thing in our lives it tells us what we can and cannot do fear tells you hey you you can't reach out and be vulnerable and and get close to somebody else because you might get rejected. Uh, Fear tells us, hey, wait a minute, you can't take that risk because you might fall on your face. Fear says, hey, the only thing you can do are, are the things that you're already confident in and you know you will succeed because if you step out of your confidence and you make a mistake, everybody's gonna know that you don't have it together. And we could go on and on and on about how fear defines the rules of our lives, of what we can and cannot do. But I'm telling you, we cannot let that be the story of our lives. There is too much at stake. There's too much at stake. If you look at the description of Goliath in verse 4 and in verse 23, it calls him the Philistine champion. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, of course he's the champion, all right? Uh, Depending on how you understand the the measurements, he's up to between 9 and 10 feet tall. And he's bigger than everybody else. He's stronger than everybody else. He's probably never lost anything in his whole life. Of course he's the champion. He's the victor. But then I realized that champion is not really what I thought champion meant. The literal translation of that word champion means the man who stood between the two. The man who stood between the two. In other words, Goliath stood between the people of God and the Philistines. Goliath stood between the people of God and the future that God had for them. Goliath stood between the people of God and the things that he desired for them. Goliath stood between the people of God And the purpose of God that he wanted lived out in their lives. And it hit me that that's the very same thing that fear does in my life. It's the very same thing fear does in your life. It stands between you and the life God has for you. It stands between you and the future that God's laid out for you. It stands between you and the purposes God has for you. It stands between you and the calling that God has for you. And rather than stepping into the valley to engage in the battle that is in your life, you just stay in that safe place, in that comfortable place, up on the hillside, saying, no, I'll just let the, the fear define what I will or will not do. And it stands between. I think about when Jesus taught the disciples to pray. You remember that story in the Gospels? Uh, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, hey, teach us how to pray. We don't know how to pray. And so Jesus says, okay, this is how you pray. You say, our Father in heaven, glory to your name. Because God, the creator, he's glorious. And everything in the world exists for his glory. So glory to your name, Lord. And then he says, your kingdom come. And your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. In other words, God has a purpose and a plan a desire, and a kingdom to reign in the world. And he wants to live out that plan, that purpose, that desire, that kingdom in your life and in mine. And that is what is at stake. 
See, the truth is that God is going to accomplish what he needs to accomplish for his glory. The question is whether or not I will be a part of it. Will I join in? Or will I let fear be the one who stands between me and what God wants to do? And so what do we do? How, how do we begin to move forward and let God, let Christ in me bring down this giant of fear? Well, I, I would tell you it begins with understanding that this is a deeply spiritual issue. It's not just a, a, a brain issue. It's not just an emotional issue. It is deeply spiritual because it really comes down to the question, am I willing or am I not willing to fully trust God even when it is scary? Pastor Craig Rochelle of Life Church says it this way. He says, what you fear the most is where you trust God the least. What you fear the most is where you trust God the least. And I found that to be true in my life. Uh, where there's some moments in life where I'm facing a struggle, I'm facing a challenge, I'm facing a difficulty. And I, I look at that and I think, well, I don't see God helping me right now. I don't see God coming through. It seems like I'm just left alone to deal with this. Maybe God's too busy. Uh, maybe God has something else to deal with. Or, or maybe God's not actually on my side in this moment. And I think, well, God must be holding out on me. Are there other moments in life where I, I'm facing that challenge, I'm facing that difficulty, I'm, I'm facing that struggle, and all I can see is that challenge, all I can see is that struggle, all I can see is that difficulty, and I think, man, man I can't see God anywhere. Maybe this struggle is the one struggle that's too big for God. And maybe it's not that God's holding out on me, but maybe God's not strong enough to deal with this one thing that I'm dealing with in life. And so I think, well, maybe he's either holding out or he's not big enough. He's, maybe he's not good or he's not great. And I, I let the fear begin to take over. But what I've learned in life is that when that fear controls me and takes over, every single time it's based on a lie. Because there is no one in creation or beyond that is more trustworthy than God. And there is nothing that is greater or more powerful than God. I mean, this is the gospel message. If you don't get anything else, please get this, that God loved you so much that he looked at your condition and your brokenness and your sin and your rejection of him, and he realized you couldn't do anything about it. And so he stepped into the world. He sent his son Jesus to take my sin and your sin and my brokenness and your brokenness and the pain of the world into his body, and he gave his life, died a criminal's death on the cross, and then he took all of that sin and all of that brokenness and all of that pain to the grave that it might be defeated forever. And so there is no problem, there is no struggle, there is no difficulty that is greater than God. And so how could I ever get to a place where I believe that the God who sent his son for me would be holding out on me? How could I ever get to a place where the God who defeated death wouldn't be not big enough for the problems in my life? It is always based on a lie. So what I need to do with that is I need to take those lies and put them where they belong. Paul said it this way. He wrote uh, to the Corinthian church. And he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Understand, fear is a stronghold in our lives. It's like a fortress around us that, that it holds us in from being able to move forward. But we have that power to bring down those strongholds. It says we demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take every thought and make it captive, make it obedient to Christ. So you and I do not have to be a victim to whatever thing that rolls through our brains. You don't have to be just passively submissive to every thought and every feeling of your life. While I may not be able to control the things that roll through here all the time, 
I can look at it and evaluate it and make a decision about whether I'm going to live by that or not. And so one of the things that God has challenged me, because I, I tell you, if any of you know about fear, I know about fear. And I know about stress, and I know about anxiety, I know about worry, and it is a battle that I fight. But what God has taught me is that I've got to take those lies that roll through my heart and mind, and I've got to take them captive. And so what do we do? The first thing that we've got to do is we've got to understand what are my thoughts. Name the thoughts. Name the feelings. Write it down. Put it out there. So much of the time we go through our day just trying to survive the day and we never really understand and we never really realize the thoughts and the beliefs and the feelings that are driving our conversations and driving our behaviors and driving our decisions and our relationships. Name them. And then take those things that we, we evaluate them and say, is it true or not true? Is what's, what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling line up with who God is and who God's made me to be and the calling he's placed on my life? And then if it's a lie, replace the lie with truth. And we can only do that if we're getting into God's Word and we're meeting Him in prayer and we're listening and we're saying, God, I need you to do in me. I need you to work in me. I need you to speak to me. Show me the places, God, where I'm letting lies lead me into fear. I can't do it for you. Pastor Bill can't do it for you. Your spouse can't do it for you. Your kids can't do it for you. Your, your parents can't do it for you. Your boss cannot do it for you. Your teacher can't do it for you. Your friends can't do it for you. You've got to be willing to submit and trust that God can do it in your life. And say, Lord, here I am, all of me, the mess and all. I need you to show me the lies and replace it with truth. You say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just not confident enough. I don't know enough. I, I can't bring this to success. Well, success is not about you, right? Who brings the victory? Where do we turn? We turn to God. God brings the victory. Or we say, well, you know, I'm afraid that I'm going to get rejected. Right? Well, there's a God who pursues you, who sent his son for you. And he says, there is nothing in this world or beyond it that will ever separate us from the love of God. And we will never be rejected by the loving father who made us and comes after us. And we say, well, I, I don't understand, I'm, I'm not equipped. I don't, I don't have what it takes to, to move forward. And God says, I put my spirit in you to enable you and empower you. And we could go lie by lie by lie by lie and say, here's the truth that God has given us to combat that lie. That we might step fully beyond fear into the life that God has called us to. And ultimately, the greatest truth is to understand that this battle we fight against sin, against brokenness, and against fear is ultimately God's battle. Look at what David says. He's facing this giant of Goliath, and he says in verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. And here it is. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. Ultimately, I can move forward and you can move forward, not because we are so great, but because God is so great. Remember that simple prayer we used to pray as kids? God is good. God is great. Now, I would add to that, God is glorious. He is good and he is great and he will overcome. If I'm willing to say, God, I will trust you, I will follow you. Just as David said, 
to the giant, the Lord will deliver you. I can look at the fears in my life and say, the Lord will deliver you. And I will move beyond the stronghold in my life. And the key for us is simply to just align ourselves with God. Where is God moving? Go that way. What is God doing? Be a part of that. Where is God calling me? Say yes to that call. And to understand that fear may not go away, but we don't have to be captive to it. See, fear, understand this, fear is a human condition, but it does not have to be a human limitation. Because the power of Christ can move us beyond We live in this paradox in life where there are all kinds of things, giants in our life that we just cannot bring down and we come up against it day after day after day. But at the same time, it seems like a contradiction, but it's a paradox that the truth is is that Jesus has already overcome those giants and we're living in in between and we just got to step forward in faith to know that Jesus will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. If we just simply invite him in. And Jesus and the Father, he wanted to be so very clear to us that this was the plan all along. It was never intended for you to take down your giants. It was always the plan that God would bring down your giants for you. And he wanted it to be clear for us. He wanted us to understand the truth and the reality of his plan. And so Jesus, as he was making his way at the end of his life to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to give his life on the cross, knowing that he was going to be beaten and mocked and given a criminal's death. Before he did any of that, he gathered with his disciples for one final meal. And it wasn't just any meal, but it was the Passover meal, a a meal that was full of meaning and, and full of this, this prophetic vision of God coming to save of God coming to provide, for God coming to make a way where there was no way. And so Jesus gathered with his disciples for that meal. And there was a script that they would often go through. And Jesus was following that script until he came to the moment where he was to give the bread. And he took the bread and he gave thanks to the Father. And then he gave it to his disciples. And then he broke from the script. And instead he said, take and eat this, for this is my body which is given for you. It's broken for you. Take and eat. And at the end of the meal, he took the cup, a cup that was a part of that Passover meal. And again, he broke script and he said to his disciples, take and drink from this, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink it. And every time you do, drink it in remembrance of me. Pointing ahead to what he was about to do, that he would do for us what we could not do for ourselves. With his body, with his blood. And so we come this morning to remember and and we invite the Holy Spirit to bring a holy remembering in us of what Jesus has done for us in his body, in his blood.